interact. And I want us to think about all of the gospels that we've just watched and like delved into. And then ask the question, if evangelical means essentially those carrying the gospel or those presenting the gospel, are we really evangelical? Welcome to the Belfast Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Byler. And this week we're continuing our introductory series answering the question, what is the gospel? Daniel and I are, are using a sermon by Sky Jitani named What is the Gospel? as a through line for this series of episodes. This week we are looking at how the gospel is talked about currently. Because we're investigating how it was used back in the day with the soldiers uh, of Rome, with the gospel writers themselves, and trying to investigate that. But we take a, a quick look at how it is used today by prominent preachers and speakers. As always, I hope you guys enjoy what we're doing here. If you do, please rate, comment, like, subscribe. I, again, as I announced earlier, uh, the GoFundMe for my Lewis trip is up. Uh, that will be linked in the description below. You can go to the website, hit the donate button. It'll take you straight to the GoFundMe page. And any uh, any gift is appreciated. Again, if you give over five dollars, you are a part of the of the special club that is going to get content related to this trip when it is over. So, there's my pitch. There's what the episode's going to be about. I hope you guys enjoy listening to it. <laughs> Uh, that was fun. Okay. <laughs> All right. So just for context, again, if you forgot what we're doing at this moment, because we got sidetracked, um, we're going to go through some, oh my gosh, sorry. My group chat keeps showing up on my <laughs> side screen. You're good. Um, or it keeps popping up as a notification in the corner. Uh, we're going to, so we, we went through what could be conceived as a couple more liberal takes on the gospel and what sky brought up to us. And now I wanted to go through a few videos of prominent evangelical, more conservative leaning. Some politically, some not even, um, but conservative theologically leaning voices who give what they, their, view of what the gospel is. So we're going to start with John Piper. This is a video he made the with the Gospel si Coalition. Six things that I think are essential. The gospel is a plan from eternity. And I say that because when Paul articulated the gospel, he said Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, which means something before signified this is a plan. God set it up before it happened. That's number one. Number two is the gospel is an event in history. Christ died. Number three, the gospel is an achievement in and through that event of something that happened between the Son and the Father. Namely, sins were paid for and righteousness was completed. This was an obedience unto death and therefore a perfect obedience was achieved and a perfect guilt offering was paid. So that's number three, an achievement. Number four is that is extended in an offer to the world that is free. If the offer were not free, there would be no gospel. If it were by works instead of by faith, there would be no gospel. So there's a plan, there's an event, there is an achievement in that event, and then there's the free offer to faith alone, and then comes what we call application of the achievement to me. They're not the same. God did something in history for me before I have any taste of it, but now by faith I am forgiven. Now by faith I am justified, and that's an essential part of the gospel. If those things don't happen to me, there's no good news at all. 
So there's the application of the achievement. That's where we usually stop. This is my concern, my own personal concern about the fullness, and I think the Gospel Coalition gets this, understands this. If we stop at forgiveness, just take forgiveness. If we stop at forgiveness and say to the world, we have good news for you. God made a plan. God sent his son. Christ died. Your forgiveness was achieved. It's offered freely. Take it by faith. Yes, you have it. And we stop, which we often do. Something's missing because I want to say, so what forgiven? And a lot of people might answer, well, I don't like a guilty conscience, or I don't like going to hell, or my family might be better if I could live as a forgiven person instead of a guilty person. Instead of saying, 1 Peter 3.18, Christ suffered once the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. The, the sixth piece of the gospel that I think is absolutely essential is that we're forgiven and we're justified to bring us to God. God is our treasure. God is the end. My forgiveness is not the end. My justification is not the end. My going to heaven and not having a sick body anymore is not the end. All of that is means. Means to what? Seeing him, knowing him, loving him, being satisfied in him, and him being more glorified in me because I'm now eternally satisfied in him. Thoughts? No, not not right off. So I've got a few things. Um, <clears throat> last conversation, we talked about typology, right? And he talked about according to the scriptures. And what I think he's mistaking, at least in part, is he well, he's conflating, right? Typology with gospel. He's conflating the pattern that scripture holds with a specific aspect of scripture's message. Because scripture has a lot of messages that aren't the gospel too, right? So let's not think that the gospel has to encompass everything. I think that's a problem too. I think the, the gospel allows for the accomplishment of everything, but that's, that's the cause and effect dynamic, right? So, According to the scriptures, sure, yes, actually. We just had a whole conversation about how it did happen according to the scriptures as prefigurement, not necessarily prediction, which is an important distinction, but it's still there. The event, death and resurrection, he talks about. Well, that's good. That's, that's good. But is that the gospel? Is that an aspect of the gospel? Sin paid for and righteousness completed. And, oh, this is going to be my point. He talks about the, I mean, he's a Calvinist. So mm -hmm. the transaction, yeah, the imputation, well, Bauckham says this, uses the same word that I just, imputation of Christ's righteousness onto me, which I believe in this, by the way. Yeah. Um, but the transaction between God the Father and God the Son. We'll talk about this when we talk about ritual and moral purity. Yeah. I, we, I might have to bring it in. Please do. I think you brought this up a few days ago, which made me think of it. Um, I think, well, A, I think there's a real reason, like a, another typological reason, that Christ meets Satan in the desert. Part of that reason is goat for Azazel. Mm -hmm. And what did you say the other day? The goat? That is 
sacrificed? The goat that sacrifices the holy goat, it's the pure, blameless goat that's ushered into God's presence through the sacrifice. The goat that's sent into the wilderness is actually the sinful goat. The one that's full of the community sin. The one that's full of the community sin. And it goes into the wilderness away from the presence of God and away from the community that's supposed to be deeply rooted in the presence of God. And so there's this this dynamic of, see, we think of the sacrifice needing the death, right? The knife through the throat, the nail on the cross, the spear through the side, whatever. But that actually isn't the case. That's what allows you to be ushered into the presence of God. The sin is pushed into the wilderness and done away with. Almost as though part of the crew, part of the ship, the whole degenerative annihilationist conversation I, we had. Like well, and I almost wrote a paper on this. Maybe I should pursue this again. Um, it is customary on this day for me to release a prisoner. I give you Barabbas. Who do you want? Who do you want me to release? Jesus or Barabbas? Who'd they pick? Barabbas. Barabbas. The goat for Azazel. The failed revolutionary, by the way. So what does that make Jesus? The pure goat. This, ha I'm just like remembering this thought that I had a few semesters ago. I don't know what this does for our, like, uh, um, Christology, soteriology. Yeah, sure. So uh, there's another word I'm looking for in there, but I can't find it. Um, yeah. So things worth thinking about that I don't have an answer to, but. Well, yeah, my, my point is Piper's talking about this whole yeah. transaction between God, the father, God, the son, God, the father, yeah. who's angry. He doesn't say this, but this is what he, he's a Calvinist this is what he means. Yeah. This is what's under his words. God, the father, who's angry at sin needs to punish it so that I can be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Do I think that might be part of what's happening? Sure. But I, yeah, it's. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. Um, and this will be something that comes up, I think, probably next episode, but offered to the world freely is his next step. And that was freely, yep, freely has to be the offer, the offer, not the acceptance. Because if, if it didn't require something of us, then it in some way wouldn't be good news. And if it wasn't applied to us, right, that's his next step, application. It's only good news if it applies to me personally or you personally, which isn't a great framework because, sorry, something to my eye, because that's, as we'll see later, that's not how the word gospel works. That's not how the word euangelion worked in the first century. Something can be good news for someone, be bad news for someone else, and still be proclaimed as good news. The idea that it has to be all-encompassing, maybe partially because God is infinite and we have all these other ways of talking about God, theologically that you then import into your use of the term gospel. But if you're using the term gospel as the first century would have heard it, that's not what it meant. That's not what it meant at all. And I was, you, you brought this up with the whole um, who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord, Michael Morales book ushered into God's presence which goat goes in which direction, all of that stuff. But the last point he talks about is it brings us to God. And again, I think that's part of the gospel and that's a consequence of the gospel. It might even be a large aspect of the gospel, but I don't, 
if we're sticking with the seven words or less, I don't think that's the most essential part that needs to be communicated. Because I think if you communicate the most essential part, all of these other things naturally become products. They become fruit. We conflate fruit with root. It, yeah. So um, do you have anything else to say before we get to the next one? I just created a whole new problem for myself, so I'm gonna have to figure it out. What? I just I just remember I was gonna write a paper on that subject, and then I was like, nah, I can't figure it out. Uh, <laughs> I for I think I forewent it. Yeah. So now I'm like, oh, I have to. I Go know back. for my God, this is so bad. I'm gonna take a class on the Book of Hebrews next yeah. semester. Yeah. I know I'm gonna have to write about just because we're talking about right now at church. I'm going to have to write about um, uh, Melchizedek. <sighs> yeah, best of luck with that. Jesus is priest. Yeah. Whole different, well, not a whole different conversation. Literally that conversation. Yeah, like, it's the same. It's the same thing. <laughs> but, yeah, so, you, should, you should pick up this book. Who shall ascend? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I need to. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Ready? So who's this? Uh, it didn't actually have their name. On oh, the this title. is Francis Chan. Um, okay. Side note, I this is maybe the it is something he said at some conference. It's not Francis Chan being like, here's essentially what the gospel is. Um, it's him kind of recounting what has happened at the event. I think some of his phrasing is interesting. That's why I added it in. Um, one of the people he's on stage with is uh is metaxas which i think is pretty funny uh so just let it be a feast for your eyes metaxas as always is uh got the drip going on so um i would say what you will about the man i don't love everything about him but he's always dressed nice i always see him wearing something and i'm like i want to take that outfit so yeah that's go fair. ahead what we were in agreement on, which is so strange nowadays, is what the gospel is, which is not in follow Jesus, you know, and, and let him go in your heart and you won't go to hell and he'll bless your life with all these great things. And no, it was it was no. He bids us come and die and that the, the, this is the clear, clear biblical message of of knowing nothing except Christ and him crucified. What God has called us to do is beautiful because Jesus is not just our savior, he, he's our example, our role model. And he, he lived this life and he was hated by the world and he gave up his life for the joy set before him, he suffered the cross. And we are in agreement that we the world has been preaching this, this counterfeit gospel that, that doesn't require repentance and death to self when it's so clearly laid out in scripture. And as we're talking about this type of suffering that we know for some people, it's like new. And I think about where, where Peter says, you know, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you as though something strange were happening to you. And in fact, I one time gave a message where I went through every New Testament book and I go, look, every single book is about suffering. It's, it's, it's clear. How do we miss that? And in the midst of that, not, not like in this scary, oh no, we're going to suffer, but it's like, no, this is a glorious thing we get to be a part of because we take part with Jesus. He's going to be with us in the suffering. And it was in the context of that message of let's stand up, let's stand together, that God gives us this prophetic word and then several prophetic words and dreams and everything coming together that I just felt like God was blessing us to where it was like an ax to where everyone was feeling a sense of awe. But it's because we were standing on the word of God, even though it is an uncomfortable message today. If someone can please comment and tell me how Eric Metaxas ended up on that stage, please let me know. At an IHOP KC, like very charismatic event, 
he just seems like I'm, I just maybe I just don't know enough about him. He just seems like an odd character to have at something like that. But that's fair. Anyway, <laughs> I just found it funny. I just I just don't know how how he's there. Um, speaking of IHOP and Kent City and charismatic movements, this sounds a lot like, and I had missionary friends who were a part of this organization, uh, live dead movement within the AG. It's this is that kind of thing you'll hear. Um, I don't think it's the instinct isn't wrong in terms of, yeah, it's going to be like, God isn't it's, it's the counter to the prosperity gospel that swings the other direction. That is the gospel of suffering, which is funny because Peterson takes that as the like existential uh, given, right? Everyone's going to suffer, um, which he then uses to talk about what do you do in response to that? This is more, you're going to suffer and like take joy in it. Which in I this world, you will have trials. I mean, that's, yeah. I'm not saying Jesus. it's a bad thing or it's even wrong, but I, I'm not thinking that Chan says that this is the gospel. He's just saying because of the gospel, because in reaction, as Sky is talking about, to the gospel that says, well, God's going to bless you. And if you send me, you know, five dollars i'll send you some holy water and god will give you 50 bucks and you know you're gonna drive a lamborghini and god says i need a private jet and all this crap well what happens when the cancer isn't cured what happens when you don't get the money what happens when the lights are shut off like what do we do when we believe the gospel that says, well, God's going to bless your life. And that means material wealth or health or prosperity. No, he actually says it's going to be really hard and you better take up your cross and you're going to follow me. It means you're going to die to self and not do everything you want to do. Right. I think all these are true. Again, they are effects of the gospel. Every one of the apostles died, was martyred. But I don't think that's the gospel either. Yeah, anything? Yeah, Chan is, I don't think he's expressing what he sees as the gospel here, but he's expressing what I think some people do see as the gospel here. This suffering death has to be required and again it's a conflation of cause and effect the fruit versus the root of the gospel and i think it's very appropriate to recognize that the gospel does account for and the biblical message does account for this but Making it central displaces, I think, the thing that actually allows you to suffer well and to die well. And if you have the gospel truly at the center, then you can do those things well, hopefully. And I hope that I have the gospel at the center and can do those things well. Like you were talking about, if you believe this, this live, okay, the gospel is going to bring you blessing. I mean, I grew up Pentecostal. Um, theologies of healing were very common. Mm-hmm. I also grew up with a congenital heart defect. Where, where does healing fit into my life if I haven't experienced it? And if other people in my life have and I've witnessed it, If that's the gospel, where's the room for me? You just don't have enough faith. Yeah. Yeah. That has to be the answer, right? If, if that's the gospel, you don't that believe has to be the gospel answer. hard enough. Yep. Because if the gospel is all of your suffering disappears if you accept it, 
and you think you've accepted it and your suffering doesn't go away, then it has to be a deficiency in you. My suffering with that hasn't gone away. And I don't think it's a deficiency in me. In fact, I think it's a thorn in the flesh God has given me because his grace is sufficient for me in my weakness. And that, <clears throat> sorry, uh, that is far more meaningful than it being okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Good. Um, yeah, do you have anything to add? No, just in cases, and you can say if this is true for you or not, but in those cases, it, it requires a certain dependency that without it, you wouldn't have. But that then begins to bear fruit that without that would not exist. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, next up, I think we have, oh, let's see. Booty. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Um, I picked Vody because, or Vody, I don't, I think it's Vody. Yeah. I don't remember. Uh, um, he's become a poster child in a lot of conservative circles for standing up for the truth, which I think he does quite well. Um, I'm not here to tear him down. Um, I think he's doing wonderful work. Um I think he has a true heart for reconciliation, regardless of what some people will say about him. Um, so I applaud all that. I don't agree with what he's about to say. So, again, the outfits, though. Always oh, fun. I know. I was going to make a comment. I haven't listened to him almost at all, I'm going to be honest. Okay. But every time I see him, I'm like, I need to listen to this guy because he looks spectacular. Like that suit is just amazing. Anyway, um, I'm just I'm a sucker for a good suit, but I guess we probably all know this at this point. Ready? Yeah, go ahead. When people say, no, our, our problem is this, our problem is that, we say, no, 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 no. Our problem is that God created the world. And God created man and he put man in the garden to keep the garden and he gave the man a command. And he held that man to perfect, perpetual obedience to that command and he promised him life if he kept it and death if he didn't. And he didn't keep it, he ate. And because he ate, because of that one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. And everyone born from that man through ordinary generation inherited that man's sin nature. And because of that sin nature, sins proceed from it. And our world is broken because of that sin. And we stand guilty before a holy and righteous God. And we know that he's holy and we know that he's righteous and we crave justice. But the problem is that if God gives us justice, we all die. And so that God in his goodness and in his mercy sent forth his son who was not born of ordinary generation but was born of a virgin yes the virgin birth matters why because if he's born of ordinary generation he's born in sin but because he's not born of ordinary generation he's not born in sin he's clean of sin his record is clean and he keeps his record clean and he obeys god's law and because he's fully god and fully man he obeys the law of God on our behalf in his active obedience. And then in his passive obedience, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. All we like sheep had gone astray. Each of us had turned to his own way, but God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. 
and Christ died for sin once for all, the just for the unjust. And God imputes our sinfulness to him. And he nails our sinfulness to the tree. And Christ dies and raises again on the third day for our justification. And there's another imputation. The righteousness of Christ is actually imputed to us so that God can be both just and the justifier of the one who places faith in Jesus Christ so that all those who come to Christ may enter in, so that all those who place faith in Christ might be saved, but not only saved, but sanctified. Because he's the firstborn of many brethren. We're justified and we're adopted into the family of God and we're sanctified, and as his children, we begin to bear the family resemblance, and we're further sanctified throughout this life by the very same gospel that saves us until one day when it's all said and done, we're not just saved from the penalty of sin. We're not just saved from the power of sin, but one day we're glorified and saved from the very presence of sin. That's the gospel that we preach. That's the gospel that we need. And that's the gospel that's more than enough. So? It's a gospel of uh, forgiveness, which I think is a true aspect of the gospel. But it sounds a lot like the God's yes defeats our no gospel. He's doing a lot of things, uh, obviously, with uh, certain ideas of original sin. Yeah. Uh, imputed guilt, uh, which I we did a whole episode on this. Yeah, <laughs> he sounds very Catholic in that yeah. sense. This is how you get around it, born of uncommon means. So you're telling me uh, sin is transmitted through semen, huh? <laughs> or sin nature? Um. He did have a parenthetical in there that uh, death through sin uh, because we all sin the world is the way it is. But again, he goes on to that. He makes the specific statements about Christ and his lineage, um, which I think are unnecessary uh, categorizations. Not that the virgin birth doesn't matter, by the way. Um <clears throat> It, ma it matters for different reasons than getting Christ off the hook for being sinless. It matters for his divinity, not his innocence. Um, anyway. Oh, and it's a gospel of obedience. That was a word he repeated a number of times. Adam's inability to be obedient. Christ's ability to be obedient then the ability to make us through sanctification obedient and a world without sin. I think all those things are true. Um, yeah, that's, I guess that's what I got. I, he's, of all the ones we've watched, I actually like that the best so far so i actually think that's less a description of the gospel and more a description of the biblical story as a whole which isn't a bad thing again just don't conflate it with the gospel that's that's that would be my request of course we have problems with original sin we've already discussed that at length um, in a separate episode we also are going to touch on it a little bit in our next conversation, 
because we're going to be dealing with some of the things from my paper that we'll be bringing in that kind of loosely are associated with it. And I'm going to be honest, I wrote the paper as a uh, giant slap in the face to reform certain aspects of reform theology. I'll just admit it, but dealing with the idea of justification, some ideas of original sin, things like that. So we have already and will explore a little bit more of that idea, but obviously have some problems with that. Um, but yeah, you're right. He's got this saved, justified, and then sanctified. Like obedience is implicit in there. And I actually, like you said, I don't disagree with that. Um, and I think that that's something that's important, but whether or not we define that as gospel or how that relates to the gospel, if it is gospel, I think is a bit more complicated than he laid it out here. And so I think it deserves a bit more explanation or at least explanation in a different way. But I would agree with you. I like his explanation most of all the ones we've seen so far. Um, do we want to go to Paul Washer or do we want to skip him? I think we could skip him, honestly. Okay, um, yeah, probably. that's good. Uh, I'll still uh, link the video if you guys want to watch it, but we'll forego it at this point just for time's sake. Yeah, because we're running a bit short, actually. Go figure, right? Um, so that brings us to, I think, the end of us trying to explain all of the things that the gospel is not. Yeah, or pieces of it that get, to use the word you've been using, conflated as the gospel. Yeah. That's going to be a common theme throughout this whole study. What are things that get conflated as the gospel that are aspects or fruits of the gospel, but they aren't the gospel? And so to transition here, we're going to go back to Sky and for a second, we're going to talk about, as I opened with the question, well, when you're going to talk about what is the gospel, yeah, what is the gospel? What does that word mean, gospel? What do, we, what do we mean when we use that word, and is that word actually what we mean? Yeah. So... Um... Yeah, it's a word that gets thrown around so much, and that is so important that I think the flippant use of it and the careless use of it has done a lot of damage to the way we as Christians think about the concept. So with that being said, let's see what Sky has to say. And then I did a little word study. ones to use it. They Tell me when to stop. I don't remember the uh, stopping timestamp. They borrowed it from their culture. Go back just a bit. It was a, a bit, very a commonly bit. you were not is where you can you can send your stuff, okay? All right, he doesn't have enough on his plate. So we're going to start with this. How does how do you actually define the word gospel? The New Testament writers did not invent this word. They were not the first ones to use it. They borrowed it from their culture. It was a very commonly used word in the ancient Roman and Greek world that the New Testament writers repurposed for their own message. So where does the word gospel come from? It comes from this Greek word, euangelion. And if I put that into English letters for you, it looks like this. Now that word might look slightly familiar to you. If you take that second letter U and you write it as a V, which is how it was often written in old texts, it looks a little bit like evangelical, which is the root word. Euangelion is where evangelical comes from. It's where the word evangelize comes from. To evangelize literally means to gospel. And an evangelical is a person of the gospel. Now this Greek word euangelion comes from two separate Greek words, eu and angelion. Eu is the Greek word for good. It's where you get the word eureka from. And angelion is the Greek word for message. It's also the root for the word angel. An angel is literally a messenger. So, 
the gospel, the euangelion, is literally a good message. The way it's popularly translated, it's good news. Now, in the ancient world, this word was not used to describe just any good news. You didn't throw it around. It wasn't like, hey, man, I got... So real quick, I think it's worth pausing on that. Um, mainly because I don't want to forget. But I want to pose the question. With just... He's about to define how a little bit more of how this works and the, the ways in which this the gospel message of the Bible as opposed to the gospel message of their culture interact. And I want us to think about all of the gospels that we've just watched and like delved into and then ask the question, if evangelical means essentially those carrying the gospel or those presenting the gospel, are we really evangelical? Because I think that's, that's the crux of the question. Are we really carrying the gospel like we're supposed to? Got to share the euangelion with you, I just saved 40% of my car insurance. That's not, that's not how the word was used. It was a very specific kind of good news. It was a good news that a new emperor or king has been born or has ascended to the throne. So when Caesar Augustus was born, the Roman imperial gospel, the announcement, the good news was that Caesar is Lord. When you went into a Roman town and someone questioned your allegiance to the Roman Empire, you would say the Roman gospel. Pause. Caesar is Lord. Keep in mind, the Rob Bell sermon we reacted to and... Domitian and Domitian's gospel. Same, it's the same thing. It comes from the same stream, right? Yeah. Same idea is going on here. Domitian was propping himself up to be what? God and king. You worship Domitian at the Domitian Games. He is has the authority over life and death. You burn incense to proclaim your allegiance. You take the mark to buy and sell. The gospel was everywhere. It's, it is about who has authority, who has the power, who controls what's going on. That's about who is king. Ready? I'll just say this. Yes, it is about who is king. And something we'll read here in a minute. It's news about a reality, whether you like it or not, right? Mm -hmm. Those in – when Rob Bell talks about those in the church, Domitian is emperor. He's Caesar. Whether we like it or not. And there's consequences. And then John says, well, hang on. I've seen it. And you know who's really on the throne? You know what the real gospel is? It's not Domitian. Competing gospels. And by declaring that, you're not only declaring a fact, but you are declaring your submission to his rule. So the good news in the ancient Roman Empire was to announce the ascension or birth of a king or emperor. That's how the word gospel, euangelion, was used at the time the New Testament was written. And the gospel writers borrow this term 
and redefine it for their own purposes. Hey, now this is sort of the easy part. We've defined the word historically. How do you actually explain the gospel as the New Testament does? Well, if you want to do that, there's really only one text in the entire New Testament you can right, go you can to. Pause there's only one place. You talked about 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah. Which, when we read uh, the King Jews gospel, <laughs> we'll, we'll be all over the book of oh, Acts yeah. and Corinthians. So any last comments on that? Uh-uh. Okay. I'm going to get us to this next timestamp, but before we play it, I'm going to do a little uh, reading of a word study that I did um, using the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the unabridged version. Um, so for anyone who's wondering where I'm getting all this information, that's where it came from. They have a very long entry on the Greek Euangelizo, which is the verb form of the noun euangelion, which is translated as good news. The verb form means to proclaim the good news. So it's, it's the same thing. It's just the action of bringing it, uh, more or less. So um, one thing that I think is interesting, um, in first talking about the, the Old Testament, um, obviously in the Old Testament, we have the Masoretic text, which is primarily in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are in Hebrew. And then you've got the, um, the Septuagint, which is in Greek. In the Hebrew version, um, the way the, the Septuagint and the Masoretic text parallel each other, you can, you can tell that the Hebrew equivalent of euangelizo is the word basar. And the means to proclaim good news. The Hebrew equivalent of the noun euangelion is um, basara. And so, you know, you can tell they're linked, obviously. Uh, and that is just good news. They sometimes this word gets linked with the, the word for good in the Hebrew tov to amplify the goodness, but even in its normal state, it usually means good news. Very rarely does it is it associated with bad news within the Bible. Um, over time, it takes on some religious significance. Um, and becomes associated with Yahweh's bringing of victory. And in some cases, and this I think is actually a really interesting point, um, specifically in Psalm 4010, it's linked with women bearing the news to a city about Yahweh bringing victory. Now, why do I think that's interesting? It's because the first people to bring the good news of the resurrection were women to the disciples. They brought it back to the city. And so it even seems as though some of the typologies that get set up flow into the way the, the gospel narratives flow out of. Do you have anything to say so far? No, that's, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't crazy. know the word comparison there, but that is really interesting. So um, in second Isaiah and not to get too deep, but I'll just explain that statement for a second. Um, I was about to say, well, you have planted your flag on where, how you think you should divide Isaiah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's, there's predominant group of scholars who think I, the book of Isaiah should be divided up into multiple um Editions written at different times by different people, all using a lot of the same themes and what you could call the school of Isaiah. Um, I would find myself in that group for the most part. I don't really have many problems. In fact, I think it's a really strong argument. Um, I don't care either way. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, I'd probably, if you pushed me, I'd probably say that. Yeah. But it's one of those things where I'm like, Again, yeah. I'm a canon guy. It's in the canon. Yeah. Uh, cool. Let's use it in its as it's presented to us, and deal with it that way. I, I'm not as concerned about how to split up the yeah. authorship of Isaiah. Obviously, 
even to say if he wrote all of it, it was all compiled into the book of Isaiah or the scroll of Isaiah later. Yeah. You know, that's, I guess, is more the debate. Did he write it all or did he not? Yeah. Right. So anyway, within the section that a certain group of scholars would call second Isaiah or Deutero Isaiah, mm-hmm. the use of this term becomes very centrally focused for how it seems to get employed and referenced in the New Testament. Um, the words they, they expect Yahweh's eventual great victory. And in some instances, it is tied to a herald preceding Israel out of Babylon back to Zion. It is not understood in these contexts as being a proclamation that is far off and coming at some point, but something that is coming as it is being proclaimed by the messenger. That's an important distinction to make Hmm. because that helps, and this will be a conversation for a way later time, helps bring into focus certain ways we think about eschatology and how the gospel is related to that. Um, They were actively returning to Zion and they were going to live in step with what that return meant in their lives there and then. Um, So this message brings a restoration to Israel, new creation and the inauguration of an eschatological age, a new age. And this is interesting because this is the Old Testament, this is in Isaiah, a new era for Gentiles who are now part, a part of God's kingdom as well. And I'm talking Isaiah 52, Psalm 96, 2, and Isaiah 60, verse 6, and surrounding. Very, very interesting, right? The inclusion of the Gentiles is inherent in the use of this term Basar and Evangelion, which become gospel, right? The good news also brings liberation to the poor. Um, this word is not just breath and sound, it's effective power. That's a direct quote from the, the commentary that I'm using. Um, so they're talking about how this word is like accompanied with God's power moving, which is interesting. Um, it's also tied to in the Septuagint, dikaiosune, which is translated as righteousness, which will become important for next week. Sotera or soteria, um, which is salvation. And so where we get soteriology, soteriology, the study, study of, of salvation. salvation. And so, um, and arene, which I believe is the word for truth, but don't quote me on that, but it, it's all tied together. And so you can see already in the Old Testament, we have the shapings of these categories being aligned with gospel in the way that they're employed in the gospels and in the rest of the New Testament itself. And I think that's important. Um, talking a little bit about Greek literature specifically, um, this word is Um, used to proclaim victory by an army to an anxiously awaiting city, which I think is interesting. The, a messenger would come back from the battlefield proclaiming the euangelion and the city would be waiting anxiously because if the battle didn't go well, they might be next on the chopping block. And so it's, it's a message of salvation in that sense right because you are not deliverance you're not going to die Um, it could also be used for weddings good news of a wedding good news of the birth of a son and specifically the son a royal son and so this is how gospel gets tied into the birth of christ right jesus birth and how that's a part of the story of the gospel Um, It's ironically used. This I thought was kind of funny. It starts to become ironically used. Emperor Nero tries to have his mother assassinated. And she sends him a euangelion of the good news that she survived the assassination attempt. Ordered by him. So that's that's kind of funny. Um, Sounds very Shakespearean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, And later, later and later in... Um, Greek and Roman history, this word gets associated with um, the imperial cult 
and the worship of Caesar. Mm-hmm. And that's important to note, right? Very, very important. So like we were talking about Domitian, man. Yep. It, it, well, it, it is the Domitian it is conversation that. that we were having, right? It, just import all of that here. Think about how you have to make a choice between the reign of Caesar or the reign of Jesus. Because the gospel of the Bible is Jesus Christ is king. That's it. And that means a lot of things. But that's it. A royal son was born, and that royal son died and was raised and is enthroned in heaven and all of the ways that that impacts our life. Christ Messiah being that typology, right? He's the Messiah embodying all of the typology carried forward from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible. Um, Let me make sure that I don't miss. And um, there was, I think, maybe the most interesting thing that's left to say is that, um, and I I could say a lot more because there were, there were a lot of points in, in the, um, the word study that I did. But for sake of time, I'll just say this. The word as it's used in the New Testament is more intrinsically linked to the way it's used in the Old Testament than all of the different ways that it's used in their culture. Probably the most, um, the most direct link culturally is that link of the imperial cult and Caesar and the way that that gets tied together. And so I think it's most important to understand that and this good news, the coming of Yahweh's eschatological victory, all of that. And if we understand those two things, we understand the significance of the gospel message as Jesus Christ is King.